Hello everyone, welcome to the ninth lecture of the course on Cyber Physical System Fundamentals. In this uh, course I'm teaching Embedded Systems Fundamentals of Cyber Physical Systems. Uh, this is the ninth lecture and this uh, lecture is uh, related to the third chapter of the companion textbook. Actually this is the very first lecture corresponding to the third chapter of the companion textbook. Uh, this is uh, the first lecture on embedded system hardware. Well, why am I teaching embedded system hardware? Why is it not sufficient just to look at embedded system software? Well, I'd like to remind you of uh, a slide of a sentence that I already showed in the very first lecture. And in that very first lecture, I was referring to a citation from the artist uh, report on uh, education in embedded systems. According to that uh, report, the development of embedded systems cannot ignore the underlying hardware characteristics. Timing, memory usage, power consumption, and power failures are important. Uh, so as a reminder, as a symbol, I've uh, put there that equation uh, to remind you of why, for example, we might uh, have to consider embedded system hardware. The reasons are, uh, again, uh, um, cited down here. Uh, you see that uh, as a reason, I'm mentioning uh, the fact that we need to consider real-time behavior. We have to make sure uh, that our applications are uh, completing the computations in the amount of time that's available. Furthermore, we also have to look at uh, energy efficiency as a special case of efficiency in general. There are also other uh, cases of efficiency efficiency, so we also have to make sure uh, that we are using all the uh, available processor cycles, so there is something like runtime efficiency. And there were also other types of efficiency that I mentioned uh, in the very first lecture. Also, uh, looking at hardware is important in the context of security. Uh, because we have to make sure that uh, there is, for example, no easy way of tampering around with uh, embedded devices that must be secure. So we have to look at uh, how these uh, uh, devices are packaged, etc., how easy it would be to measure the current. All these things are relevant for evaluating the security. And also, if we look at the re reliability, uh, we have to look at uh, the underlying hardware uh, because the available reliability, the resulting reliability, very much depends on the underlying hardware that we are using. So for these reasons, we have uh, to look at embedded systems hardware, and it's not sufficient just to look at embedded system software. So therefore, in this course, in uh, this uh, chapter 3, we are looking at embedded system hardware, and that is the next chapter that we are considering after that chapter 2 on specification and modeling. In this uh, chapter, we are discussing a number of components that we need in embedded system hardware. And the components that I will discuss uh, will be uh, discussed according to their order in the so-called hardware in the loop. In this hardware in the loop, we are starting with the physical environment. That's why we are also talking about cyber physical systems. And then the next uh, component, actually the first component in this loop, is uh, the set of sensors uh, that we have in such a hardware in the loop. And the next uh, type of component is uh, the sample and hold circuit. Uh, we also have uh, conversion uh, from uh, analog value domains to analog uh, uh, to digital value domains. Furthermore, we need information processing. So somehow we have to process the information that's uh, coming from the sensors. We might have a display. And in most of the cases, we do have to convert the digital values back to analog values uh, because, for example, many of the actuators that have an impact on the physical environment are controlled from analog values. So this is uh, the set of components. This is a set of component types that we will be considering in this chapter. And obviously, we will be starting with uh, the census. 
Uh, before we look at census, uh, I'd like uh, to uh, point out that there are indeed uh, some examples of uh, such loops. Uh, heating uh, sometimes comes with a very simple case of such a loop. Uh, so if if you have uh, this uh, device that I think you're uh, well aware of, uh, you have uh, such a sensor, you have very simple information processing, and there is some actuator which is controlling the amount of water uh, that is used for heating. Then if we have uh, illumination of rooms, uh, we also might have such a, a control loop. Uh, we might have a sensor which is measuring the amount of illumination and then controlling uh, the amount of uh, lights that, that, that is uh, making sure that we really see what we want to see in, in the room, for example. We also have examples of such loops in engine control in uh, the automotive domain. Uh, there we have uh, sensors that are measuring certain values there in the engines. Uh, then there is some information processing. In many cases it is rather complex uh, information processing because we would like to make sure that the engine is running as smoothly as possible and uh, the resulting uh, values will then have an impact on for example the amount of gas gas which is injected into the engine we have a similar case for uh, power supplies here we are measuring uh, voltages and then we are controlling uh, the amount of electricity that is uh, available uh, so that as a result we have a stable voltage there may be other uh, cases of such loops Finally, I'd like to mention robots. In robots, we do have a number of sensors, and then we have some information processing, and then we have some actuators, which are then having an impact on the physical environment. So there are many such loops that uh, do involve uh, these uh, sensors. Now, sensors are a very huge area, and I can only provide you with very few uh, examples. Sensors allow us uh, to start uh, this uh, hardware in a loop uh, with the first component which is needed there, this very first component which is capturing uh, physical information and in most of the cases generating some uh, electrical information there from the uh, physical information. Uh, there are sensors for uh, virtually all physical uh, quantities, so we can have sensors for weight, velocity, acceleration, electrical current, voltages and temperatures, and also there are sensors for many chemical compounds. There are many physical effects that can be used for constructing sensors. So as an example, we can use the law of induction, which means that we are able to generate voltages by using a coil that we are moving in a, a magnetic field, or we could also generate these voltages if it's a fluctuating magnetic field. Also, there are some light electric effects, and we will discuss uh, uh, some of them in some of the coming uh, slides. There is a huge amount of sensors that has been designed in recent years and we have to be aware of the fact that some uh, of the uh, applications that became available recently uh, are rarely exploiting these uh, very new sensors without the progress in sensor technology. Uh, many of the nice embedded devices would not be available. I'd like to provide you with some examples. I cannot really give you a full list of sensors because that wouldn't even be feasible if we had a full course on sensors. So as an example, I'd like to demonstrate this little acceleration sensor. This little acceleration sensor which has a mass there in its center. Uh, from the scale here on the right hand side, you can estimate this uh, size to be about one uh, millimeter in one uh, dimension. So you have in total about one square millimeter and uh, uh, this little mass there is uh, connected through some tiny wires and if this uh, mass is moving around uh, then the resistance in these tiny wires will change and by measuring uh, the resistance of these tiny wires uh, we get an impression of the acceleration. So if uh, this mass in the center is moving around, like in this little animation, uh, we will have a changing uh, re resistance there of uh, these little wires, and as a result uh, we will be observing uh, that acceleration. 
Uh, there are other sensors, and as a second example, I'd like uh, to mention so-called uh, charge-coupled devices, or CCDs, uh, which are a special case of uh, image sensors. Uh, with uh, charge-coupled devices, we uh, can take uh, 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 copies of uh, images, we can take pictures, or we could be recording videos. For uh, CCDs, we assume that there is some incoming light. Uh, this incoming light will induce uh, some electrons there down in this layer in, in the circuit. And uh, using some uh, moving voltage, we can move these uh, charges here in, in this layer uh, towards uh, one of the sides, toward the boundary of this device. And there we can amplify uh, the resulting voltages. And by measuring then these voltages, we have an impression on how much light actually shown onto uh, this, this little device. Uh, the electrons are being forwarded from one place to the next by using this uh, moving voltage and therefore uh, we are using this term over here. We are also calling this a so-called bucket brigade device. So it's a little bit like uh, passing on uh, water from one position to the next position in uh, this uh, kind of bucket brigade. So that is one device that can be used for uh, designing image uh, sensors. Uh, there is a second class of devices that can be used for designing image sensors, and this is called a CMOS image sensor. In uh, CMOS image sensors, uh, we have a, a rectangular area uh, that is uh, sensitive to, to light. Uh, this uh, rectangular area is uh, used uh, uh, in a way very similar to rectangular areas in, in memories. We can address the different pixels that are available there in this uh, rectangular area. Uh, so in that way we can address, for example, certain rows there in in this uh, uh, matrix-like organization. And then the uh, image information from a particular row is made available at uh, the boundary, for example, at the boundary shown down here. And then we can use analog multiplexes to select uh, one of the columns here uh, from this matrix. And we would be amplifying these analog uh, values. And we would be uh, converting them to the digital domain. And we could have some post-processing there even on uh, that uh, very same chip. And we can uh, read out the corresponding information there at the pins of this chip. Uh, this uh, table compares uh, the different uh, characteristics of uh, CCD and uh, CMOS uh, sensors. Uh, for CCD sensors, we have a technology which is optimized for optics, uh, whereas uh, for uh, CMOS sensors, we can use standard uh, VLSI technology. So we can use the standard technology which is used for fa fabricating in integrated uh, chips. So we see in one case it's a special technology, in the other case it's a standard technology. Uh, for uh, CCDs, we do have the disadvantage that uh, it's uh, impossible uh, to integrate uh, logic there on the same chip, uh, whereas this is feasible for CMOS because there we are just using the standard VLSI technology. Uh, so uh, these uh, converters, for example, to the digital domain, some simple digital filters, uh, can be integrated on the same chip, which is not feasible for CCDs. For CCDs, we do need the serial access. There is no way that we can uh, address uh, any of these uh, pixels in a random fashion, whereas this is uh, feasible <coughs> for CMOS. And we can use it, for example, uh, for reading out uh, just a, a, uh, a small area of the overall image instead of re reading the entire image. For CCDs, we have the disadvantage that their size is limited, uh, whereas for CMOS, uh, we are able to design rather large uh, sensors, uh, which is very important if we would like to go for a very good uh, quality. Power consumption for CCDs in general seems to be a little lower than that for CMOS devices, so that when we go for the smallest power consumption, there may be an advantage for uh, CCDs. However, CCDs are usually too slow for video mode, so they may be okay for images. However, if we would like to record videos, we might have to go for CMOS devices.
Uh, the applications are actually changing over the years because the different characteristics they are changing over the years. It might happen that in certain years uh, you will, will be implementing uh, one certain application using CCDs, whereas a few years later the same application might be implemented with CMOS devices. Uh, so therefore it's uh, not really uh, recommended to, to mention certain applications there because uh, the type of applications that I would have to mention there for a certain uh, year would be changing over time. Now continuing uh, the uh, different uh, sensors that we might uh, use in uh, embedded and cyber physical systems, I'd like uh, to point towards uh, biometrical sensors. As an example, I'd like to, to mention the fingerprint sensor uh, that is available in the notebook from which I'm doing this uh, presentation right now. You all know that uh, there is some uh, interest in increased level of uh, uh, security and uh, for uh, this uh, fingerprint sensor uh, might be used. As another example, I'd like uh, to mention an example uh, that is intended to be some help for handy people, in particular for blind people, uh, there has been quite some effort on trying to provide limited eyesight uh, to uh, blind people and one of the early approaches was uh, designed as uh, shown on the slide. You see there that the blind person is supposed to wear uh, glasses on which a camera is mounted. This uh, camera is then connected to a computer which is uh, worn at the belt and then the computer is uh, connected uh, to the brain and in that particular example uh, the designers uh, claim that uh, the uh, best way of making sure that there is a good contact with the brain uh, is to actually drill a hole into the bones and then to bring the wires into direct contact with the brain. So over here you can see uh, this uh, hole that is uh, drilled into uh, the bone of that uh, person. Now that approach is uh, obviously no longer available. The institute uh, doesn't exist anymore and more recently other mechanisms have been used for providing limited eyesight. For example, translation into sound. Uh, there is a website from which uh, you can download uh, a movie showing you how a sound can be used to provide uh, a limited equivalent of eyesight and there is a person reporting about uh, how much uh, this uh, limited uh, uh, way of getting some uh, information about the optical um, images around that person uh, is uh, um, there in the, in the movie. Okay, for copyright reasons I'm not showing the movie, you should do that yourself. Now there are some other sensors, I could talk for hours, for uh, weeks actually about sensors. I'd like to mention uh, rain sensors that can be used for wiper control so that if there is more heavy rain, uh, wipers in the car move more rapidly whereas they move more slowly if there is very little rain. There are pressure sensors that can be used, for example, for controlling uh, the engine in the car. There are uh, proximity sensors that can be used for uh, avoiding accidents when you park your car. Uh, there are other types of engine controls. There are so-called Hall effect uh, sensors. For Hall e effect sensors, we have uh, a device which is uh, typically designed from uh, some uh, semiconductor material. Uh, there you have a certain current in one direction. You use it in such a way that you have a magnetic field uh, in uh, one of the other directions and as a result uh, you would be having an induced uh, voltage in uh, the third dimension and by measuring uh, that voltage you will then have some information about that uh, magnetic field. So these are all different sensors uh, and uh, like I said we could design and we can design uh, many more sensors and I could uh, talk uh, for a quite long time about different sensors. <laughs>